Hola, yo soy Carlos. Y yo, Miguel. Welcome to Puente Bridge. Stories that connect us. Hola, I am Miguel Hernando Torres Umba. Welcome to Puente Bridge. This is the very first episode of our very first season in which we are celebrating Latin America in the UK. We are very happy to be sharing this with you. And our guest of today is an Argentine activist with a PhD in Migration Studies, Social Sciences and Social Linguistics. She is the current CEO of Focus on Labor Exploitation and she was also the former director of the Latin American Women's Rights Service as well as the coordinator of the Coalition of Latin American Organizations in the UK, CLAUC. A woman who has passionately worked to support the integration and recognition of the Latin American community in this country. But before we go to the interview, I wanted to let you know that we recorded today's episode at the Union Chapel, a music venue in Islington known for its beautiful architecture, the rich cultural offer of music concerts and events, and the support they provide to people facing homelessness through their charity, The Margins Project. We wanted Puente Bridge to be recorded in cultural spaces in London and the chapel kindly opened their doors and welcomed us, for which we are very grateful. Now, without further ado, here it is, our first interview of Puente Bridge with Lucila Granada. I hope you enjoy listening to her story as much as we enjoyed making this episode. And hello, we are live. Hi. Hi. Hola. Hi, my name is Miguel and we're here. It's the first time we're doing our podcast called Puente Bridge. Um, and we're very happy because we finally started. We've been preparing. We've been gearing up to this moment. We got this wonderful place, which is the Union Chapel that allowed us to be here today. Uh, and we're starting. So we're going to be telling you some stories about Latin American people and how the Latin American culture has influenced in the UK. And we're going to do it through a number of interviews. And through the interviews, you're going to learn about us and how and why we are here and how it is exciting for us to be here and for you to have us here too. So we're going to do it. And today, uh, we're thrilled to have our very first guest. Um, the reason why this guest is very special for us is because this guest has been doing in the UK what the Puente Bridge wants to do. She's been bringing visibility to Latin American people and she's been campaigning to bring more uh, of that visibility and recognition for us here for around 10 years. But I'm going to let her introduce herself in a moment. But, however, I want you to think about this thing for a second. Up until 2011, there were about 250,000 Latin Americans, at least in the census. And since probably the number has increased, and, and we don't really know how many, but certainly way many more than those. However, we're not recognized. And you know how when you apply for a job, you fill in a form and you can tick your ethnicity. Well, we're not there and we were not there up to that point. So a group of organizations and volunteers had been working and campaigning to get that recognition through. And in 2011, this group of people got together, formed a coalition, and then after campaign to get the first borough in the UK to recognize us, that was Southwark. Uh, and that marked something very, very important because from then on, that campaign has been growing and we've started to be recognized. Now, that, of course, that was a communal effort and loads of people have been involved in this. But today we have someone who was at the forefront of that campaign. Uh, and, oh, wow, she might be a shy when I say <laughs> that. But soon we're going to hear how she's been part of this. Um, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Hello. Hola. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm Lucila. Lucila Granada. I'm an Argentine migrant in the UK, Latin American migrant in the UK. Um, and yeah, I worked with the uh, Latin American organizations for many years, uh, campaigning for ethnic recognition. Thank you. That, I mean, thank you for coming and, you know, being our first guest. How was the process for you to get involved into this campaign? Um, so I, it was kind of um, by learning, I guess, uh, in many ways, because I actually came to the UK to do a PhD in uh, 
different topic initially that ended up being related to this, but it was on social linguistics. And uh, that kind of brought me to uh, some of the frontline community organizations that are now involved in this campaign. Um, and to also understand the wider situation of the community uh, beyond their linguistic situation. Um, and yeah, through that kind of contact with the uh, issues, the need, the inequalities, I, um, I kind of became more aware of the need for some sort of uh, structural change, some, some policy change that needed to happen to, to kind of support the integration of the community. And that's where the, the recognition made sense. And, and that's when we realized, you know, it's not only a box that you tick and you feel like, okay, yeah, I'm here. I feel included, which I think it's important as well, obviously. But also because the, the, the recognition and the inclusion of the category Latin American in ethnic monitoring progresses a much bigger process of integration. That process needs to start somewhere for you, right, as well, when you get here in the UK. So which, where, where was your door? How did you enter that? My door was IRMO. Uh -huh. It's a community organization in Lambeth, um, supporting people in Spanish and Portuguese and the local community as well in English, but it's a Latin American organization. Um, and that was the main door, I suppose, because it was the, the, the space also where I learned a lot. I learned, to, I learned that I was a migrant myself and that a, a lot of the things that I was uh, studying were also kind of happening to me. Um, I became part of the community as well there. I, I found a space where I was, you know, I felt like I belonged and, and it was a space where I could feel at ease while outside. It's not that it's a hostile society at all. In London, it's very diverse and it's very inclusive, but at the same time, it's very difficult to always navigate those differences. So at Irmo, I think it was my introduction to the whole identity of being Latin American. So I was going to say Latin American. Is that where you, when did you learn that was a thing? I think it becomes a thing in general when you migrate because, you know, I've, I'm not even Argentine in Argentina. It's like, you're, I'm actually from my neighborhood or my, you know, from this family or this age. But you're only something when, uh, you know, kind of in contrast with other people's identity. And when, when I was, when I came here within the Latin American community, of course, you're from one specific country but outside of the Latin American community you become Latin American because it's um it's kind of the the category that would make more sense and that um connects you to something that people recognize as well and also in a way by getting involved in these practices and and making friends and working with people from other countries in Latin America you 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 identify you you feel the commonalities and so it's something that kind of happened to you, I guess. Yeah, we become Latin Americans here, mm -hmm. really. It's, it's true. Um, so you're clearly very political and very, you know, engraved in the community. And this is, you know, an important work. But when, I'd like to go back to your childhood and to you. And I want to kind of ask and understand a little bit where your motivation, your political motivation begins. If you can recall a couple of moments in your childhood where you can go, oh, ah, yeah, I started. You know, on my way here, I was thinking that actually my first uh, memory as a child was um, was a, a political event. And I didn't know that at the time, but um, I was two. And I remember being like, in the back of my father's car. And with, we were six. Uh, we are six. But uh, we were six in the car. I was, I was only two. And my brother, I have three other brothers. Um, and so I was with one of my brothers, like uh, kind of at the back of the car and, um, we were celebrating something with like little flags, Argentine flags. And we were all like singing songs and, and people were walking around the car and we were in this kind of square going around the, you know, uh, the Obelisco, which is like a big monument in, in the, in the capital in Buenos Aires. And I remember being there and I asked my mom after a long, like many years later what what it was and it was the return of democracy to argentina wow so i guess i always had a thing for <laughs> politics because i somehow isolated that memory and and kept that memory so that was your first, that's fresh. your memory of, 
uh, the first memory a political event <laughs> and a, a small one just the return just just the just return <laughs> of democracy to Argentina well probably it was a lot of emotions going on and there it must have been a really intense moment of you know happiness for everyone and kind of um got stuck in my memory and in the relationship with your family do you do you have moments of you know I, I want to think change things in my family or these are things that I want to do is any, any moment yeah talk to us a little bit about your family and your relationship maybe with my them. family I've got uh three older brothers and my parents um are both Uh, well, uh, fortunately, um, and well, politically speaking, I mean, we're we're in completely different corners. <laughs> we never vote. My father always says we never vote the the same candidates in you know ever. We ne that never happened. Um, and it's usually a Sunday in Argentina when you have elections, so it's usually like a family day as well. People go, you vote, and then you meet uh, at somebody's home. Home, and it was always my parents' home. Um, And the, the joke would always be around that, you know, we were in different corners of the table because we would probably were very mad at each other uh, for voting so differently. Um, but I guess, you know, the, the politics really, you kind of affect everything in, in, in everybody's lives, even if we don't like politics or even if we don't want to engage in politics. Um, and actually, when we were celebrating the return of democracy, I think it meant a lot more for my family because we had, uh, you know, my, one of my aunties was disappeared and the return of democracy meant that potentially she could be coming back from, from I don't know, from Uruguay or from Europe or, you know, a lot of people um, exiled, you know, or ran away from Argentina during the dictatorship. So anything could happen and it was, it was a lot of hope, I suppose. And that Um, and how about, um, there was a book you were telling us also about earlier when, before we started a book about, uh, you have a memory as well with it. Would you like to share that with us as well? Yeah. So when I was, um, eight years old, I, I was, we were watching, uh, this TV show that was really a bad journalist, <laughs> to be honest. It was, it was really bad. I, I, I very, this, I dislike this show, this show very much. Mm -hmm. They uh, were treating this very sensitive issue uh, very badly. And so they had a um, couple of children there with their schoolmates and a very poor family on the other side of the plateau. And um, they were talking about how these two kids were um, appropriated during the dictatorship and they were raised by the military, this military family. And the, new, the biological family had found them and wanted them to return to them because they were taken from a person who was shot dead basically during the, the process. And it just struck me that it was such an unfair situation that children hated the idea of going uh, to live with their biological family for many reasons, but I think it was very clear that it was also about money and class, but also obviously, I guess, belonging and and who raised them and, and the mindset and the family, the biological family was struggling so bad. And um, I remember seeing this and not understanding what, you know, wanting to understand more. more. And so I asked my, my father to bring me a book that they were mentioning in this uh, TV show. That was Nunca Mas, It's Never Again. And it's a book that, um, it's, a, it's a research, basically. It's an investigation into all the horrors of the dictatorship. And it has, you know, descriptions of the tortures, the names of the people that disappeared. Many of them, not all of them. Obviously, um, you know, this, how the cells were, you know, the, the spaces, the, the different, uh, the centers that were clandestine where they kept... Um, Uh, people kidnapped basically it was a lot of like really hardcore stuff to read at eight years old uh, but um but I wanted to understand what I was expecting a history book to be honest so I asked my father can you can you bring me this book that you know apparently explains everything I need to understand and he got very mad at me <laughs> he sent me to my room how dare you you know um you're only eight and he got really mad at me um I didn't understand what, you know, what happened. And then the next day I got the book. He, yeah. He, yeah, he brought the book to me. So I read it. You shouldn't, nobody should read it at, at, at that age. 
But um, it is an important book, I think, and explains a lot of what it meant on the ground when we talk about the, you know, um, how harsh dictatorships can be. Wow. <laughs> mm. I don't think I was reading that kind of books at eight. That was not, definitely not my thing. Uh, well, that, that definitely shows us, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, wh where, you, where you ended up later. And there was something else I wanted to talk and ask about. It's, um, it's your relationship with your brother. Um, what can I share about that? My, um, I don't know, I, we had a nice childhood with, full of like fights, <laughs> like you should. <laughs> um, but I guess one of the things that kind of uh, marked my childhood for me is that obviously they are men and I am a girl, right? But, but they're boys and I'm, I'm a girl. So, um, yeah, I remember that was kind of a struggle for me to see that, you know, uh, the expectation was for them to do whatever they want and be rough and like play with their bicycles. And they were always, they were older as well. So they were allowed to do more and go farther away from home. And for me to be, you know, on a dress at 4 p.m. at home playing nicely. And I hated it. So I remember I, I never, wore, I would never wear a dress. I would never, you know, I was always struggling with that. Um, you know, why can't I climb a tree? Why can't I, you know, uh, play outside? And what is football? Why is, what is so interesting about football that I can't <laughs> do, you know, and things like that. Um, yeah, I definitely remember that being a big part. Uh, wow. Um, so I'm going to kind of want to use that to fast forward. And, and that idea of what you're saying, why can't I play? Why can't I be part of? sounds very relevant to, to today and what we're talking about in terms of the Latin American community. Would you say there is a relationship there with what can I, what can I? Yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, but I, I guess that um, it's a feeling that, um, I don't know, I, it seems very natural in front of like injustices, right? Like, why is this happening? How can, why is this person not allowed or why are we not there? Why, why are you not considering, you know, what we want as well and, and things like that? And um, I guess, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that that was the feeling in my family. It was, I guess, in a way, a very good challenge that I felt when I was a kid. But here, um, definitely, I think the, 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 the you know, finding um, people, meeting people in, in this organization in Irmo that were struggling in a way and for reasons that are kind of, you know, so far away from, from what they they can do or they can change sometimes that it's uh, it feels really unfair that the system or the structures are designed in a way that don't give you any chances um so i think that same feeling of like no we have we have to do something this has to change it's definitely there uh, and do you feel in that do you feel like it's changing is it changing in any way or form yeah, I think it's changing. We have, um, we've been campaigning on this issue of recognition, the inclusion of the category in ethnic monitoring um, for years. And we got official recognition in four boroughs, the main boroughs of Latin American concentration. That's uh, four London bor boroughs. Um, and then we also got recognition at the London level. Um, but obviously we keep campaigning on this and we know that the community is growing and we're now in more boroughs and in more areas outside of London. So we definitely need to keep going and there's more that needs to be done. But um, yes, I do feel like we've already, you know, kind of made the very big first step of actually securing those spaces. And, and how, how do you think that's, that change is contributing to both Latin American people and the wider community here? To the Latin American community, I think in, a, in many ways that are perhaps not easy to recognize or link to the recognition process itself, but that um, are very much linked. So things, for instance, um, some of these boroughs have run consultations on different issues, uh, things like isolate loneliness and elderly people, or uh, now with COVID-19, um, the needs of the communities and what is happening that obviously, uh, you know, um, I think something that everybody working in low pay will know, but perhaps needed to be put on paper, that is that low paid precarious workers are more exposed to COVID-19 and therefore, and a lot of times, uh, ethnic minorities are overrepresented in this sector. So uh, when we, uh, we when these, these debates and these discussions are happening, uh, 
the Latin American community is part of many of those conversations now, thanks to recognition in these areas and then also the campaigning work of the coalition uh, of Latin Americans in the UK cloud. So I feel like for Latin Americans, there have been many small and big or symbolic changes. And for society as a whole, I think especially in these areas, um, I feel like, you know, we brought visibility to a sector that is there, that has a lot of potential, that has its, its incredibly um, entrepreneurial community. Mm -hmm. I feel like we have initiatives for everything. <laughs> There's a lot of, I don't know, restaurants and dance groups and, you know, um, artists everywhere really and but there's also you know nurses doctors psychologists there's so much potential in the community and so much to give that um like opening the doors and creating these type of platforms are actually enabling the, the community to contribute to society more and um yeah i mean yeah. <laughs> uh yes yeah, it's, 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 i've understand it, this process also through having lived here for about 13 years myself um, and, and now I'd like to kind of um, question a little bit and ask a little bit more about your uh, individual recognition and <laughs> your individual and how, how do, you, do you feel proud of the work that you've done? How I feel proud? I feel very proud of uh, the work that we've done as a collective. I feel like the community has gone really, really far. You know, when, when we started, when I met you also. <laughs> The organizations were um, uh, working pretty much in isolation, uh, you know, not a lot of collaborations, but also um, the community was a lot more invisible, not just because of the lack of recognition, but also the lack of research. And, um, uh, you know, obviously everything changed from no longer invisible onwards. Um, I feel very proud to see the organizations organizing without me, you know, and, and, and not that I'm necessary at all, but because I was for so long the coordinator and the kind of the person at the front, um, you know, not being there and seeing that the coalition goes on and that the initiatives keep growing and, um, you know, there's soon going to be new projects uh, or increased advice during COVID and things that have to do with uh, campaigning and advocacy work again. That makes me really proud to see that the project mm -hmm. goes on. Uh, I, I just want to add on, obviously, the, one of the things I, I personally feel very proud of, of seeing you and, and the, the, the work that you've done, uh, it's also that level of, um, you're very humble as well, mm -hmm. as an individual, and very generous. And of course, I, I, it's all been a communal work, but I think that generosity that you bring is also very important and commendable for, for mm -hmm. us and for everyone. And I think it's, it's, it's beautiful to see that, of course, you've spent a lot of time, you've chosen to spend your life campaigning for this and nobody else has and other people choose to do what they want. <laughs> You've chosen this path and, and there yet still that level of generosity, which I think transpires into the work that you do. So I, I want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I feel very proud. Also, I've <laughs> met you before and I remember also earlier, the, you know, the first projects we were running, kind of like everybody trying to do something and to see how you and the team and the other organizations that hopefully we're going to have also here mm. to, to talk to them have done for us and for everyone, I think it's, uh, it's epic, <laughs> epic to say the least. Um, to start kind of closing, I want to ask a couple of questions. Um, one is uh, about what um, do you think or what do you think the, the UK has been giving you as an individual? The UK has given me a lot of challenges, <laughs> a lot of um, um, interesting challenges. Some are not so... You know, some were not um, always, um, I guess, the most constructive challenges, especially when it came uh, to to face the the kind of strictness and 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 heavy power that the immigration system has. And I only had a taste of this; like it was really, really small. Um, which obviously makes you think about undocumented people and so on, and how tough it can be for people with insecure immigration status. So, yeah, a lot of challenges. Some were very positive. Some made me learn a lot about myself, test me, test myself, I guess, um, in figuring out how do I react really to this. Um, yeah, in migration, a lot of times because people don't know you, they don't assume anything, not even the good things. So you have to, you're going to be what you do. And I think that 
unlearning of who you were told you are and this kind of discovering and uh, you know confirming who you are has been quite a quite a journey mm, thank you and uh, and of course i mean it's been we've been talking about it now and it seems pretty obvious to me at least but i like to ask you nevertheless what have you brought to the uk what do you think you've provided given this country? um yeah this is the hardest bit i think because uh, when you're working with uh, in coalition always you're you're trying to identify what we're doing together and i think i appreciate what you said it's really nice um yeah i put a lot of time but i feel like an individual cannot make this type of change because it has to be collective and it has to represent um the many voices that are that need to be included in the the debate so i feel like I gave a lot of energy. I gave it. I gave a lot of, um, I suppose, the manpower <laughs> to or the woman power uh, to make things happen, um, and hopefully that made a difference for, yeah, for the community, but also for society as, as a whole. I guess I progressed their chances to get to know Latin the Latin American community. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and just like asking one of the final questions, what would you like for the future for the Latin American community? Ooh, what I'd like to see is um, a l more leadership. I'd like to see more. Um, I want to see the organizations that are there and the, I'm not meaning just the NGOs, but also, you know, the initiatives that I remember I started as a seed, you know, small project in somebody's uh, dream. Uh, and that are now whole projects and whole careers and whole profiles um, strengthening. Uh, and I want to see, yeah, the organizations and the structures that we set up grow, but also, you know, new um, expressions, new new voices. Um, I'd like to see the the campaigns that are starting, especially I, there are many groups that are looking at, you know, the diversity of sexual identities and genders in the community grow and establish themselves and and i want to see latin americans in every board <laughs> in every space here we go <laughs> are you ready <laughs> uh thank you very much lucilla for coming to to be with us it was a short interview and uh, i think there's so much more we can talk in for the detail and we hope that we can bring you again in the future to talk about more those more of those subjects in more specific ways but thank you very much for coming thank you thank you and good luck Yes. Yeah. So here we go. That was our first episode of Puente Bridge Podcast, where we're going to be introducing you to more Latin American people in the UK and also other people who work with Latin American culture and who are very passionate about it. But that was our first episode. Thank you very much for tuning in and stay alert for more. And we did it. This was our first episode of Puente Bridge. I hope you found Lucila's stories as inspiring as we did. After speaking with her, we felt even more motivated to work hard and help build a better world. It is a difficult time for all of us, but if we pull together, we can get through it together. By the way, the book Lucilla mentioned in our conversation is called Never Again by Ernesto Sabato. And if you want to know more about the work of the Coalition of Latin American Organizations and the Campaign for Recognition, you can check the website www.clauk.org.uk That's www.clauk.org.uk If you like what you heard, help us by leaving us a comment and a review. Follow us on social media and share this episode with all your friends. Remember, this episode is also available in Spanish, presented by my colleague Carlos. Puente Bridge is produced by Umba, Film and Media, created by Carlos Osa Valencia and Miguel Hernando Torres Umba. Sammy Fiorino is our associate producer. Nelson Cruz, our community manager. The graphic design is by Fabian De Asa, and the music is licensed by Artlist. Puente Bridge Podcast, stories that connect us. <laughs>